Okay, thank you. Um, well, I've got some images on the screen, which, and I'm going to be talking to those largely. Um, uh, I've put something up already, which uh, is going to be testing the whether your your glasses prescription is up to date. Um, <laughs> it's um, a poem written by David Smith titled The Landscape, and it dates from the 1940s. It's, uh, it's, um, and offers a helpful point of entry, I think, into his sculptural practice and towards the themes I want to talk about in this little presentation. Now, I concede that it's hardly a polished literary work. I have never looked at a landscape without seeing other landscapes, he begins. And uh, let's see, there we go, that's the first line. And what follows is a meandering list of places and images, morphing from one to the other. The lines set in motion a stream of metaphors that proliferate almost uncontrollably. Halfway down, we veer, for instance, from ancient Assyria to a river in Ireland to Indiana. We move forward and backwards in time from the prehistoric to the contemporary. He describes how faces and apparitions loom out of the formations of woods and mountains. The landscape is constantly congealing into figurative form. But then comes a break in the stream of associations as Smith adopts a different register. Quote, the position of vision has undergone changes, he writes. He is responding then to the historical present. He's not talking about a timeless point of view. Something has changed about the position of vision vis-à-vis -vis the landscape. In other words, Modernity has altered the way we see the world. His attention turns almost immediately to the aerial view as he considers what the marks of human activity look like when you're peering down on them uh, on the surface of the earth from the upper atmosphere. And the last lines of the poem offer an image of oil cylinders as seen from a plane, quote, 64 belly buttons for 100 square miles. It's the look of this instrumentalizing use of the land that Smith is concerned with here. Smith made sculptures by welding steel. He wasn't the first to do this, but he liked this approach because it had its origins in industry and had little significant artistic precedent. For him, iron and steel were the materials of modernity. When he used this medium to represent a landscape, as he did on a number of occasions in the 1950s, we have to understand the resulting works as reflecting not a timeless terrain, but as evidencing the conditions by which landscape is configured within modernity. Not just the look of human interventions in the land then, but the changes of the way land is seen, the position of vision, quote. The formal issue he has to under, under, overcome was how to communicate multiple points of view, uh, this modern way of looking at the land, within a single stationary sculpture. And take um, the work which is on your screen, Song of the Landscape from 1950. One way to understand the two rectangular apertures that appear towards the top of the composition is to see them as frames that the landscape exceeds. The aligned fixed point view is pictorialized as but one vista onto the world. Our view, as spectators onto the figure of the land, is roaming, ungrounded, displaced, possibly disconnected. And in his better known work, Hudson River Landscape from the following year, now installed in the new Whitney Museum of American Art in, in New York, the theme is refined. In song, uh, rods and small sheets of steel were bent and welded into a configuration resembling a cradle or basket, but it still invokes, possibly too literally for Smith, a bird's eye view of undulating ground. Hudson River avoids this by adopting a vertical format and a more frontal composition. Whiplash lines provide an armature, while smaller <coughs> angular metal shapes are clustered at certain points in ways intended to hold our attention. According to Smith, 
The design was an accumulation of many sketches that he had completed on, a tra on train journeys between Albany and Poughkeepsie, both stations on the Hudson Railroad. But Smith chose not to privilege a single coherent vista. Instead, we were offered an array of disconnected shapes signifying multiple fleeting glimpses. The landscape appears to us as fragmented views. The land, punctuated by marks of human activity, is enframed in this sculpture as a, si a single self-contained form. In the work, the larger topography, the terrain, the 75-mile stretch of the Hudson River, which is the ground for human activity, for the railroad, light industry, shipping, etc., all this is brought close and unified in this one sculpture. But it's presented in such a way that it always remains distanced, however near we choose to stand as spectators to these metal rods. This is, I think, sort of quite an interesting, complicated, problematic that he's looking at, but it, it strikes me that perhaps this is how the land appears within modernity. It's seen as an abstraction, as something that's afar off from us, separate. And although Hudson River landscape is nowadays displayed in a gallery setting, Smith himself chose to photograph the sculpture in the open air, against the backdrop of the sky, with a field and trees visible in the distance, which you can make out in this slide. This begs the question, what is the relationship between the sculpture and the landscape background? Is the photograph claiming the work as indigenous to this place? Or is Smith merely invoking an abstracted, blurry notion of nature to provide the ground for his figure? And recent scholarship on Smith, which is very strong, tends towards the latter view. There's nothing particularly original about citing sculptural monuments or sculpture outside in urban centers or urban parks, but the tradition of intentionally placing sculptures out with the built environment in natural settings is reinvigorated in the 20th century. And what we're looking at here is the British sculptor Barbara Hepworth. She's got um, uh, this uh, A sculpture, um, probably um, from the 30s or 40s, and it's been placed on the beach, um, probably at St. Ives, with the, with the waves lapping around it. And it's from this very interesting film by Jaquetta Hawkes, Figures in a Landscape. Uh, um, this is a very you know, strange thing to do, um, to put sculptures in a natural setting, but it's a very important one, and it's a legacy that continues, and it's one to which Jeffrey belongs. And although I'm showing a Barbara Hepworth on the screen, the most well-known expe exponents of this position were possibly Hans Arp or Jean Arp, um, Henry Moore and David Smith. And these three artists are, I admit, hardly representative of all the many sculptors from around the world who've been interested in locating their work in natural settings. Yet they serve as helpful points of reference for evaluating subsequent sculptural practices. Each of them, in varying ways, made statements in which they voiced their commitment to seeing their work cited in nature. And they advocated this for different reasons, but they were all concerned with matters of terrain, landscape, the environment, or nature, or natural processes. Registering their intentions is one thing, but it takes more work to read the relationship between the forms of the sculpture and a natural setting as amounting to a visual statement about the modern world. And I'm bracketing out from this conversation works such as Richard Serra's Shift, a sculpture that consists of six concrete walls which take their dimensions from the topography of the site, or Carl Andre's influential notion of sculpture as place, in which an intervention in an environment shifts a viewer's perception of a certain location. And during the 1960s, many artists moved from producing vertical, self-contained forms sited in a landscape to marking the site directly. And such art of the latter category activates a heightened awareness of the horizontal reach of an entire landscape. 
And this isn't quite the theme I want to pursue. Instead, my focus is on works that are non-site-specific and offer a symbolic representation of the idea of nature in a more general way. Take more. Um, art historians have acknowledged the positive associations that he placed on the very idea of, quote, the outdoors. Moore grew up in a polluted coal mining town in North England and regarded the British countryside as a restorative um, social force. He viewed the land as archaic and timeless and as an antidote to the aggressive forces of modernity. This, arguably, is reflected in the abstracted forms his sculptures assume, since the work's composition often seems inspired by natural materials and processes. He massed in his work forms in ways that made them look as though the same erosive forces that shaped the rocks and the hills had formed them also. And this morphological affinity makes it easy for commentators to interpret his sculptures as being of the landscape or, quote, in harmony with their chosen site. Now, Arp, whose work was informed by 1930s surrealism, wrote that he wanted his art to, quote, find its humble, anonymous place in the woods, the mountains, and in nature. His concept of nature is even more abstracted and less culturally specific than it is for, uh, for more. He took blocks of plaster and cut and sanded them into biomorphic forms, shapes that are intended to evoke processes of natural evolution, decay or growth. These visual um, Associations are accentuated in Carola Gideon Welker's amazing book from 1960, Contemporary Sculpture and Evolution in Form and Space, when she juxtaposes photos of Arp's human concretion, which you see on the right-hand side, from 1932, with um, a photograph by an unnamed uh, source of uh, droplets of snow, globules of snow melting. And on the following pages, um, we get a picture of a sleeping signet on the right-hand side with um, the shepherd with the clouds from 1949 to 53. And the visual claim that is being expounded is that Arp's sculpture belongs more to the natural world than it does to the realm of history and culture. Art, Arp took a dim view on human progress and believed that nature could redirect the course of humanity. Now, Smith, on the other hand, is quite different. As most art historians and critics have recognised, his installations seem intended to strike a more dissonant chord. And this is often apparent from the photographs he took of his sculptures located in the fields around his home at Bolton Landing, on the shores of Lake George in upstate New York. It's striking how disjunctive and anomalous his works look in their rural setting. Unlike Arp and Moore, who aspired to make sculptures and then place them in the landscape so that they seemed attuned to their natural surroundings, Smith sought out disjuncture and contrast. In his photo of his stainless steel cubi, notice how Smith has positioned the horizon line of the distant trees, uh, tree-lined hills, on the far side of the lake, just below their elevated forms, accentuating their incongruence with the undulating shapes of the land. The composition deprives us of an impression of their actual size. The low horizon line makes them appear monumental, disproportionately large in relation to the size of the human or to any, quote, natural order of things. We might suggest that these attributes seem intended to testify to the instrumentalized relationship that modernity adopts towards the land. Now, Jeffrey's sculptures is, I, I, I mean, and this is completely open 
for discussion, but I think it's closer to Smith than it is to Moore or Arp in terms of the contrasts and discrepancies his sculptures establish with the surrounding landscape. Many of his works make less of an attempt to blend into the scenery and look deliberately anomalous in their setting. And this seems particularly true for the Series 2 sculptures, largely because of their prominent knuckle joints, which feature in four of them. And I I must uh, confess that I wrote all this before seeing them, which I did yesterday, and if I was writing this today, I'd I'd probably have some different sentences to give to you. But uh, this was my interpretation looking at these images, and I don't think I've gotten them quite right, but they imply the possibility of... Um, for me, anyway, of mechanised moving parts, as though they might possess the capacity for immense talk, but are presently lying idle. They're vaguely reminiscent, for me, of sections of large-scale heavy machines that might be used within, say, the extraction industry. Their proportions are such is that they loom over a viewer in a way that feels threatening. They don't come across as either graceful or elegant, And to position them on a grassy expanse in plain sight of woods, mountains, and sea seems intentionally provocative. And I wouldn't wish to ascribe to them a single simple meaning, although they don't strike me as particularly celebratory of technological intervention in the land. However, I don't think it's possible to speak in equivalent terms for many of the later sculptures particularly those from series six onwards, which do seem more in accord with their environment. And this work, for instance, is made from weathering steel, and its reddish oxidized coating somehow looks less man-made when sighted in a natural setting than does the burnished glimmer of stainless steel. And these associations are, of course, culturally conditioned, but nevertheless they are important to recognize. The material, metal, is... Um, meant to signify quite differently than it does in series two. Machinery and technology is no longer the reference point. Instead, the work seems more informed by different modes of knowledge, ones that are more ancient and time-tested. Its curved organic shapes and use of cast forms consolidate this impression. And from from a distance, its silhouette is not dramatic. Instead, it invites viewers to see it from close up, its upper forms framed against the open sky. And this is in contrast to the Series 2 sculptures, which I think accentuate the ground plane in a quite different way. And these observations are not intended to lead to clear-cut conclusions. I only want to stress that across the park, the landscape setting plays varying roles for each series of sculpture. And I'd be curious to hear more from Geoffrey as to how he understands the relationship between his work and their landscape environment, particularly given his broader insights on agriculture and land use that we heard about earlier on today. There we go. Okay, Geoffrey, do you want to respond? Thank you, Alistair. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, and on the tour, I did speak to, to this. This is the aspect of counterpoint that I see. The pieces all through this landscape are in counterpoint, which is a very different thing because counterpoint also implies harmony. And so it can be dissonant, but it also remains part of the single aspect of looking at a piece. So... The transitions here have to do uh, with how the work evolved in its time and in its relationship. Uh, The landscape itself is such, and and having lived here, I, I know how rapidly the landscape here gobbles up human endeavor. You know, like the first parts of it is is how fast it'll lead up farm fields and how fast it will just simply transition out of where it is to another space. So the idea that human beings are here to compete with that space, and often in BC that seems to be the case with logging and other aspects of it, mining, uh, using it as resource industries are, are, are really very different than this particular approach because this particular approach places human endeavor within 
the realm and in counterpoint with this environment which it's otherwise, uh, even the way that the, the landscape was created here in, in its initial stages was, it's be, it became very clear to me that this had giant cedars on it where the springs came out. And so the first exploitation of it was simply to remove all of the landscape from it. So as a person coming into this on a latter day basis, it, uh, it, it did provide an, an open environment for this work, but it also required, in my mind, in the evolution of civilizing this part of the country, of actually coming into this aspect of, of nature that was here, that human beings had to be in counterpoint with it. And that meant not try to compete with it. And as, if we look across to the logging over there, they now have these giant machines that'll take down acres in a day. And all of a sudden, the, it'll be rainy one day, and then a f few days later, we we'll find huge swaths taken out uh, of the mountains over here. So that is one activity that keeps going on here. And what I wanted from this work was to be able to say, okay, human beings can be here, they can be here of a scale where they can live with this and live in counterpoint with it. And understanding counterpoint then is not only the internal aspects of the sculpture itself, but how the sculpture represents human counterpoint within this environment so that it's not a sense of defeat, but rather a sense of living in counterpoint with it without itself trying to either blend in and be part of it, but also uh, how to act in such a way that the counterpoint actually exists. So when you look at each one of these uh, uh, photographs that you have here, is that you have each one of these pieces, both coming from very different series and in time and evolution, working in counterpoint with the very environment that they're sitting in. And in both cases, and that's still the way that I saw David Smith's work. The difference is, is that originally I had this work very concentrated so I could go to show, and I can see that David Smith did the same thing over his lifetime. It was like, well, if, if the work needs to be picked up and moved and go to an exhibition, you've got to keep it accessible. In 1998, I finally spread it out over the place, even though I had plans on doing that for many, many years. And so selecting the sites was selecting a counterpoint, uh, selecting a counterpoint position for each one of the works. And so in a way then, the work could either act independently, which was what I wanted to do in, in 1980 when I got back to work. I, rather than do a James Terrell or a Michael Heiser uh, on the property and dedicating it to one single piece of work. I love the idea that uh, you could do individual pieces and allow them to evolve and evolve in counterpoint with the environment. So that was really, th the way that I measured each piece, which I didn't talk about on the tour, was is that I would bring it outside the barn, which is a, you know, a very, very large structure that's very imposing that sits right there. Each piece would come out of the barn and would have to live with the landscape in every direction here when it came out of that particular situation. If it could survive, and I would give it a year usually, and then I would photograph it. If it could survive this landscape, then I felt that it was a strong enough piece to act in counterpoint to the landscape itself. And so, I think I had the advantage in, in growing out of David Smith to be able to look at each piece in counterpoint to this environment rather than, uh, rather than to try and do an entire piece like Michael Heiser say out in the desert or impose human will on this. It, the imposition was significantly, I think, more modest in terms of being able to l keep the pieces within the realm of human scale, which I thought was the genius of David Smith, and uh, still have the piece work in counterpoint with this essentially bone-crushing environment for, for a sculptor. I mean, after all, when we look at what the environment is, we realize how dominant it is. And if you look at uh, even uh, upstate New York is a little calmer than here, but you can see that David Smith's work 
itself presented itself in terms of this rather overwhelming landscape of mountains and space. So it's this concept of maintaining counterpoint and human presence in counterpoint, which isn't trying to say, okay, this has to be a, a, an invisible harmony that's going on, but rather counterpoint itself. And I look at both the internal counterpoint within the work and the external counterpoint, as it may exist in an environment like this, as to be uh, essential aesthetic principles that have gone on throughout art history. So that when we look at the caves, even though uh, they're two-dimensional and in the cave, they really are, each piece works in relationship to that particular cave. It's, it's the same thing that was done 35,000 years ago and done in counterpoint. Certainly it was an invasion of the caves, but it was also something in counterpoint in counterpoint with the entire idea of the cave and uh, the ability to be able to use it and find human beings in counterpoint with the entire environment. And I think that this was part of the goal. This is definitely the goal that I had in, in, in all of this work here. So I think that uh, the evolution of the work took its own course and uh, it could only happen in a way that, the way that I know with each one of these pieces is that they couldn't happen until I could actually do them and conceive of them. So each one of those pieces came that particular way. So as we get towards the end of the, the, to the last series, the pieces get smaller and, and, and deal with that landscape, then they get larger again. But, I couldn't do the piece on the left until I had done the piece on the right. That's just the way that it is. It just couldn't have come the other way around. So that's... Alistair, if you'd like to respond, and then <clears throat> if John Kirk, who helped shape and mold this uh, farm, uh, would like to speak and offer any comments, because you've spent years and years shaping and molding uh, landscapes here and on the Gulf Islands. So, Alistair. I actually, um, I actually don't think there's much need for me to respond to, to that, Jeffrey. Um, I, I thought that was very interesting, what you said, and uh, spoke, spoke very clearly about those issues that I was interested in knowing more about. Uh, so maybe we could just go straight on to John. John Kirk. I'd, I'd like to share with you something when I started working with Jeffrey. In the back fields there where Series 8 is presently located, and now Series 9, um, one of the first times I ever walked back there, the, the canary grass was over my head, and we'd go through there, and we'd just come across one of these huge core 10 pieces in the grass. I mean, it was like tracking through the jungle and here's a Mayan ruin or something. It was quite astonishing. But then turning that around and uh, the sites down uh, in the main field now where those core 10 pieces got moved, uh, I mean, they weren't necessarily put on pedestals, but they were on rises. Um, and, I, and I, of course, it was Jeffrey's vision to see how he wanted to see those pieces. And a lot of the my challenge was to get into his mind uh, so I could visualize what he's wanting, which was never easy. So a lot of there's always a pond nearby where one of those pieces is sitting to get the spoils, to get the piece up, and to be able to see it. So, uh, um, and it was always been interesting to see the evolution from as Jeffrey moved through the different series, and certainly getting into uh, the series nine, which he's still working on the amount of space it requires for one of those pieces because they command so much space to walk around. They're so bright and when you walk into the back fields and you know, one catches your eye, you don't want it to distract from another one that's behind there. So it's been a, a lot of challenging times staying ahead of Jeffrey's sights so that there's room for the pieces. But uh, it's been a very interesting process to try and make it all work and Sometimes it fails and we have to 
redo areas to finally get it right sometimes two and three times because sometimes it takes two or three years to get a an actual site ready uh, for a specific piece and uh, so I'm, I'm concerned in how many more pieces Jeffrey has left <laughs> how much room we have to keep making and expanding but like I say series nine it takes a lot of room to view those pieces and uh, show them so it's been interesting thank you John it's, it's so nice to hear from someone who is part of that process, and, and often folks like you don't get a chance to speak. So thank you very much. Um, would anyone else like to add anything to that or to anything in Alistair's paper? Karun. Yeah, I just I wanted to ask Alistair to maybe elaborate a bit more. I didn't quite get the, um, and, then, and maybe you've moved off the subject of modernism, but can you elaborate a bit more on what the significance is of uh, the landscape and the object and modernism? Is this something that you see as a particular development in, in modernism at a particular time? I didn't, maybe I faded at that particular point, but could you elaborate on that? Because there's three other sculptors that you presented. Um, and then I have some follow up questions, perhaps. That's a, that's a good question, and I'm still working this out for myself, but it seems that, uh, well, firstly, I would say that there are many different types of modernism. Uh, that's very important to acknowledge, and uh, it's, it's problematic to homogenize them. Um, however, within the history of modernist sculpture, we do see at the beginning of the 20th century, or at least in the first half, a decision by a number of uh, keen protag sort of advocates of that term to place their work outside of a gallery or outside of a museum. And they do that for pragmatic reasons, um, space, obviously. Uh, they, sculpture takes up a lot of space. It's easy to have it outside. Uh, they, um, but it also, with, with Moore and Hepworth in particular in Britain, we see something rather strange, which is they heave things out of, uh, out of buildings uh, because they're made of materials that wouldn't weather well. And they, they sort of present them to the world by means of ph photographs surrounded by trees and land and um uh, or or the sea or whatever a sort of non, a sort of natural environment uh, an environment where signs of human activity are um kind of bracketed out of the conversation and that struck me as rather an interesting thing and it's an acknowledged phenomenon and uh, smith takes it up he works in stainless steel for a very particular reason uh, and the justification is that it it is an ideal metal to use if you want to have metal out of doors in your sculptures it doesn't it doesn't weather so rapidly as as other steels and and uh, that was ignored by Greenberg famously who who didn't care about um uh, this sort of landscape component that was important to um uh, this this brand of modernism, and uh, the works can be seen indoors. It doesn't make a difference. But Smith clearly thought that there was something important about seeing sculpture outside of the outside of of a building or or a, a man made structure. And and I um, I I think that's probably very important for Jeffrey as well. And. Uh, he spoke about that just now. Um, as to uh, w the larger story about modernism, uh, I'm more hesitant to speak about that because I don't see there as being any kind of categorical break, um, unlike other people, between modernism and postmodernism. I think it's very, very muddled, and it's different uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, I certainly don't see Carl Andre, Richard Serra, Michael Heiser, Richard Long, um, to name some land artists, as doing anything that's particularly different uh, from the modernists. They are um, intervening outdoors uh, 
um, or in wilderness situations in different ways, but I think uh, their agendas are often quite similar in some respects. Um, so as for... I did think about presenting a, um, a conversation where I would speak in more general terms and, and list off some isms and so on, but actually that's remarkably difficult to do. Um. Jeffrey, do you want to respond to that? And then yeah, I, I really do. Jennifer. I've spent a lot of time talking about postmodernism, and now I'd like to deal a lot more with its definition. This is by Leotard himself. So first time I encountered it, I, I never thought about postmodernism. I didn't even think it was a concept. Uh, the first time I encountered it was in New York. It had become a buzzword after 1982 with the Philip Johnson building. And it became a buzzword among the dealers in New York. They had decided that the works that they were selling were postmodern. So it became a, a straight up marketing term. So it's been disturbing to me all of these years because to me it has only meant being a marketing term. And as it has become more intellectually used, it is even more disturbing. So what I'd like to do is simplify this a bit by the, peop by the very person who, in my mind, defined postmodernism and did it, uh, duh, in an essay called What is Postmodernism? And that's Leotard. So I, I'd like to read it because I think it's really important because I think it's an important part of this discussion. Uh, what then is the postmodern? What place does it... Uh, does it or does it not occupy in the vertiginous work uh, of the questions hurled at the rules of image and narration? It is undoubtedly a part of the modern. All that has been received, if only yesterday, moto moto, Petronius used to say, must be suspected. What space does Cezanne challenge? The Impressionists, uh, the Impressionists. What object do Picasso and Brock attack? Cezanne's. What supposition, supposition does Duchamp break with in 1912? That which says one must make a painting, be it Cubist and, and Buren questions, that other suppositions which uh, he believes and survived untouched by the work of Duchamp. The place of presentation of the work. In an amazing acceleration, the generations precipitate themselves. A work can only become modern, can become modern only if it's first postmodern. Postmodernism, thus understood, is not modernism at its end, but in its nascent state, and its state is constant. So I think, oh, sorry, I apologize for that. that. That's probably the most succinct statement of what it is you just said, you know, by the person who defined postmodernism himself, which is we're in the nascent state of the postmodern. You can't be in the postmodern state unless you've actually had modernism. And what he looks at in terms of modernism, the way that I interpret it is, is that it sort of comes to an end in the displacement change by the time, duh, the cubists, I use the word duh because I, I don't think they ever used that terminology themselves until the, it was adapted. So what this is really saying is, is that modernism in its time was in its time of displacement. And this is something that really, we'll talk about it tomorrow in terms of music, why there was such an ease between the fixed narrative or the pictorial narrative of, uh, uh, of, of music when Incredible Counterpoint was written in terms of, Incredible Counterpoint was written uh, in terms of the Gregorian chant. In fact, the, the terminology comes from that particular period. The issue that I see here is that music was able to do what we call abstract now, much, much easier and much easier transition so that it made absolutely no difference whether there was a narrative or not a narrative. The B minor mass is one of the examples that I have. In other words, the voice, human voice was not to be discounted. It simply could be part of the same abstraction that music was viewed to be. And in art, there was a tremendous reaction against that. And until, and that's because the artists, I think, had a job to do. They had a job to immortalize the warrior class. I think that that's what they did uh, ever since the, the age of agriculture. And that they, you know, they were expected 
by their ability, their analogous ability that they were born with in, in being able to draw to perform the function of telling a story to essentially illiterate people because we don't even have a concept of literacy until uh, post-Renaissance, you know, a universal literacy. It was very, very particular. So the way that history was passed on was the job of being able to immortalize all of the great stories of battles and inventions of gods and all of those other things to be able to pass those on as a cultural statement. So the interesting part is, is that music has significantly, as I understand it, now I, I, I'm, maybe Christopher will straighten this out tomorrow, a much easier transition into its abstraction or its instrumental time in the Baroque period than art did for the next uh, couple of hundred years. And I think what liberated art to be able to do that was uh, the photograph. The photograph meant that anyone could be immortalized in, in, in this picture. The, the role, uh, usurped the role of the artist on one side, and on the other hand, it liberated the artist. So what we see in, in the independence, or the, the impressionists, if I use that word, is the use of color, which couldn't be done in photographs. And in the lenses that were available in those times, and especially since they would spend you know, minutes sometimes in, 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 in their exposures, the details on those glass plates was absolutely incredible. And, uh, and so the ability of the, of the artist to be able to draw that he's born with became significantly less important once the photograph displaced the portraiture that was there and was able to immortalize, immortalize anyone. So we see pictures of Civil War soldiers themselves probably killed not long after their photographs were taken uh, as part of the immortal statement of, uh, of, that, of that particular war. And I think that that's part of what goes on within that century. So what happens is, and this is, to me, this is exactly what Leotard is talking about, is that Cezanne displaces the Impressionists, and then, uh, uh, then he in turn is displaced. And it's this period of displacement, of rapid displacement within the art world between about 1870, let's just say 1870, and 1914, that really is the period of modernism because it's the period of displacement. And it allows abstraction, as we see with Kandinsky, uh, to, be as important, to be as important as pictorial narrative. And it brings up the question of abstraction and its equality with pictorial narrative. It doesn't have to displace it. And that's been part of the, the problem that I have with this whole idea that there's some clean cut between postmodernism and modernism. I think it's absolutely silly. And the reason why I think it's silly is exactly what he says, is that once you go through this period of extreme displacement so that it makes no difference whether a piece is abstract or has a fixed narrative, just as in music it makes no difference whether or not the piece is abstracted or has a fixed narrative, then we reach a point where we are postmodern, and I'm as much a postmodernist as anyone else who would claim to be a postmodernist. So modernism itself is this transition in art that the Baroque period of music went through with its counterpoint and its extraordinary counterpoint. Part of that in the Baroque period was the, uh, was the uh, universality of certain instruments, which finally came in tune with each other, so that the oboe, oboe was able to be able to uh, be tuned, you were able to tune the strings to the oboe. And so once you had that particular situation, then you could deal with the manufacture of the other instruments beyond the ear of the actual composers, and that allowed for this vast expanse of counterpoint once those instruments were able to cover the whole uh, uh, gamut that the human voice could cover. So what happened with the photograph is it simply liberated, it simply liberated the artists. On the other hand, it displaced them as well. It took their jobs away from them. And, 
And so as we get into that particular period, we get into a vast displacement up until about World War I. And then after World War I, we're all postmodernists. That's by definition, is how you arrive at a point where the displacement has reached its point much the way I remember seeing an instrument show on, on 18th century instrument makers, well, actually prior to it. And if whatever you could imagine, you know, trumpets that went up like this and swirled around and wind instruments of all sorts that were just very, very strange and as well as string instruments as strange as you could possibly imagine were part of the instrument repertory until it became objective to try and be able to do and write the music in such a way that it could be passed on to generation to generation to generation. And when that happened, there was a revolution in music. And that revolution in music is the one that we, we now listen to and, and it be, has become very familiar to us. So this is the same type of transition that I see happening uh, between the time of the advent of the inexpensive photograph and, and World War I. And that would be what we could call the period of modernism because it was the time of displacement until we get to a point. I know that when I went to university, nobody cared what mode anybody was working in. What they really did care about was the intent of the artists around them. And it, so the idea of infinite invention was the way that I, I came to art. And so it really didn't matter. It really took a matter of judgment, not a matter of trying to find some cutoff point that would be good branding. And this branding of postmodernism, I just saw it coming into existence right there on the marketplace in 1983 in New York. Mm. So I, I don't know what it is. That's what I'm saying. I, I never understood it the way that I understand it. I understand. Leotard and his, his argument about the narrative that came with uh, the, uh, the University of Berlin, I understand that very clearly. But I never, and I understand his argument about postmodernism in terms of what became art and how that happened. But I don't understand it as something that should be divisive within the, within the, the discussion of art at all. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, Jennifer, you had something you wanted to say. Yes, thank you. I think uh, it's just fascinating how theater history, just to step outside the subject a little bit, confirms absolutely what you're saying, that the distinction between modernism and postmodernism is absolutely arbitrary and artificial and doesn't exist. We can look at the most, you know, arch-modernist mm -hmm. theater artists, you know, Cocteau or Stravinsky and so on, and if you analyze what they're doing on the stage and what supposed modernists, mm -hmm. like Julie Taymor or Robert Wilson are doing, it's precisely the same thing. So absolutely, theater history confirms that. Theater history is also interesting in comparison with your statement earlier, Alistair, about uh, the desire to take sculpture out of the gallery, because that was one of the central motives of theater artists in the modernist period, too, was to get theater out of the theaters. And at first, in the first um, phase, they were trying to <clears throat> really get theater art into unconventional spaces to liberate the art from all the conventions that had accreted around the, you know, bourgeois theater practice and the theater building itself, the lights, the audience, the separation between the audience and the, and the uh, performance and so on. And first they took theater um, works into urinals, uh, the storefronts, shopping malls, uh, the streets and so on. And in the second phase, which could be called postmodernism, but really is the same thing. The the tendency is actually to return theater to its location in nature, actually. And it's called site-specific theater nowadays, but really it's a return to the ancient Greek practice, which was to perform theater outside uh, mm -hmm. with the vision of the Mediterranean beyond the actors and so on. So there's there's a real parallel there for sure. But Jennifer, where would you put the agit prop? Of, of say the Soviet Soviet period because that certainly had an intention and, and it was performed in factories on the streets on trains absolutely well as Alistair said modernism is a multifarious phenomenon right so I mean there were not there was not one strain of modernism for sure but getting the art out of the conventional space was certainly a big part of almost all modernist theater.
Do the students have anything to say? Annabelle, you're looking very uh, quizzical. I have, a, I have a question. And then Paul. I understood, I have understood that, especially in Britain, this relationship with the land had something to do with nationalism. And both Henry Moore and, and Hepworth were using particular native stones and really engaging with what it was to be British at that time. And when we were going around the sculpture garden yesterday with Geoffrey, he was saying how his use of materials is, in a sense, a direct, in direct opposition to the European um, compressive style, which he, uh, he sort of said was repressive and oppressive. And I was thinking, I was wondering how that relates to the sculpture being in the land in the same tradition of that kind of you know, sculpture in nature which has come out of modernism and whether that's something you thought about when you were putting it in the landscape. The, uh, the idea of the compressive, I related to the European tendency to repeat rebuilding of Rome and that what a disaster that was for Europe right up until 1945. And so the connection was less so of where the material came from, but rather what the result of trying to rebuild Rome was from a historical point of view over again, you know, so that the destructive qualities of rebuilding Rome were really the, the prime sickness of Europe until finally there was very little left by 1945 and left of the concept. So uh, that's a very different thing. That was a transition into the American culture, uh, the question of steel, the expansiveness of steel, and the breadth of steel and its ability to move, move us around the world in the way that it has actually been able to do. So that was not so much a comment about the landscape as it was uh, the imposition, the the imposition of human beings in the landscape, and the imposition of human beings in the landscape, as I've said, can't be to try to dominate it, which is essentially what steel did. It just took it over and took ownership of it, which I think is a disaster too. But on the other hand, as a material, it is. Nature is international and touches more humanity than any other material that I know of. And it's that touch of humanity which is really, I look at as, as the meaning of the modern statement of art. So that it represents humanity itself, not the material world. Um, as, a, as a teacher, uh, I often have to deal with these concepts, these overarching concepts, and try to characterize them to students because it's, they're very difficult to um, define. So we tend to characterize them as a way to understand them. And uh, just to be really brief, because uh, I could give you a, the two-hour version, but I'll, I'll give you the five-minute version. Natalie got, to, Natalie got to hear the, the, the half-hour version in the car yesterday. Uh, but, but we could characterize uh, m uh, modernism in art uh, in the f pre war pre-Second World War, um, and uh, uh, as, a, as a questioning of the, the discipline of art, as itself, and, and looking at the essential characteristics of what art is. Um, and uh, so whether it's expressionism or cubism, or these are all questioning various aspects of what art could be. Um, and then post-war, uh, the term modernism, which is now termed as high modern, modernism, is really uh, characterized through Greenbergian formalism as it relates to specific disciplines. So rather than looking at what is art, we're looking at what is painting, what is sculpture, and it becomes uh, much more um, focused on those aspects. So uh, in painting, we're looking at what are the essential characteristics of a painting, uh, 
drips, splatters, color, two dimensionality, uh, non representation. Um, and there's a reduction. So there's, an, there's a, in both whether we're looking at the essential characteristics of art or the essential characteristics of the specific mediums uh, within the art, there's a reductionism, and it's, it's, that's sort of the altruism of modernism, is this, this idea that it can evolve to a pure state. And so there's, uh, you know, there's many reasons why artists want to do this. Um, and, and many of them are good intentions. Uh, however, what happens is we see with minimalism, we get to a point of reduction, to a point where people's voices uh, are, are limited to a certain degree. And what becomes characterized as postmodernism is an adding back in. So if we see as minimalism as maybe a, a fulcrum uh, towards late modernism, the postmodernism is, is well, what, what can we put back in because maybe my voice uh, isn't heard. Uh, so other cultures become marginalized. Um, indigenous cultures become marginalized. Uh, and, and people uh, want, have other things they want to talk about, particularly if we think of uh, America being at war uh, in the late 60s, and artists want to maybe talk about other things than whether, uh, rather than just the formalism, the formal qualities of, of the work. And, and so uh, that's really a little bit of a break, not in terms of the overall larger question of whether it's art, because the adding back in is also a questioning. Um, so is it still a painting if I use photography in it? Which Greenberg, uh, with, in terms of Greenberg, Greenberg would say, no, it's not a painting. But you know, we have movements like photorealism and things like that where we're bringing, contaminating the disciplines and hybridity. And secondary disciplines start coming up, like performance art. Uh, you know, where you have the com combination of two disciplines uh, coming together, or sound art, uh, and these things start to grow. So, um, uh, so what do you, can you wrap up somehow? Well, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. It's I, I, it's, but 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 it could go on and on. But I mean, the thing is, is that it it really isn't. I don't think it's as cut and dry. I think there's still this questioning going on, and certainly postmodernism isn't isn't an end of it, that tradition of talking about some of these essential the, characteristics. The problem that I see is... And I don't think it's just a marketing ploy. No, no. The problem that I see, and, and it grew more in the 1970s than it, it grew in the 1960s, but I think it, it had its beginnings in the 1960s, um, was that art became an ideological argument. Probably it was in, in terms of the Russian Revolution in, the, in that particular time. But you're really talking about ideologies here, like the purity of sculpture or the purity of painting. You know, that's an ideological concept, and that's a scary one. That was rejected out of hand by my generation of artists in the studios. We, we could not could not conceive of an ideological art. And you can see from what Sergei was saying, is once it becomes ideological, you begin to bring it to a point instead of allowing it the freedom of being able to spread out. So if you're talking about a reaction to that ideology, then, then that's something else. And that's something that, as I said, when I was in graduate school, no one thought at all that they were ideological artists. They used every discipline that you could possibly imagine. And ideology never entered into the issue, in, in, at least in the middle and late 1960s that I know of. Now, it may have gone on in New York, but it certainly didn't go on in the, in the, in the Midwest. So I, I don't know. So what you're saying is, is the way that you see postmodernism is you see it as a reaction to the kind of ideological purity that people were actually calling for in terms of the criticism. That's strange. I'm not, I'm not sure that I ever, ever encountered that ideology. And not that it didn't exist. <laughs> not that it didn't exist, but I think it came later for, from my point of view. I, I, don't, I don't know it. I'm not familiar with ideology in art. <laughs>
Okay, we, mm -hmm. I, I just have a small question. Can you identify yourself, please? Identify yourself. Um, I just a very small question for Jeff. No, no. Oh, my name is Marlo, Marlo Rainey. Sorry. Um, I'm a high school student from North Vancouver. Great. <laughs> um, I'm interested in knowing, Jeff, having grown up in a vastly different society than we have today, I'm... Um, I'm interested in knowing if uh, you see any trend in the changes of um, how art is how art is uh, is demonstrated in society, how it's how it's put into society. I'm just curious how if you see any trends in in the, in the changes of it. Um, I've been working with uh, a lot of young art historians. And uh, when I say young, they're 30. They're not young to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I'm seeing is, is, is this change? And I'm seeing this change from what I think it was an ideological split, you know, like uh, of doing that to a far more open reality, which is the reality, which is kind of a throwback for me back to 40 years and 45 years ago, which to me is very, very welcome. So... Uh, yeah, I'm hoping that that continues. That ideological part of trying to divide artists among themselves, I think, is, was a, a very, very terrible thing. And so, uh, yes, I am seeing that that's starting to happen. So I think that that's a very positive sign. So that's a continuation of that conversation. And uh, Sergey, or anyone before who hasn't spoken before Sergey? Sergey, okay, go ahead. Uh, Try to I, get more people speaking. Yeah, I would like to come back to relationship between the sculptures and the landscape. And there are many ways how look at particular questions or particular sculptures. So I would like to share my personal view of Jeffrey's work from the moment I walked in this sculptural park, first time in my life. I think uh, it's important to emphasize that um, Jeffrey not only picked up where David Smith left off, but actually advanced it far beyond. And that has to do, in my personal view, with gravity. If you look at the series number one, they're all very balanced, like is David Smith's work, but the gravity dev definitely holds them down. If you look at any joint where any cube connects to the others, there is a tension, there is a pressure. They exist in gravity. Now, if you look at the series two, just this arm. The joint on the right, that's where the tension is. The arm, even if in reality it supports a lot of weight, but it doesn't feel like this. It feels I can take a piece of paper and slide right underneath it. It moves, it fights the gravity in the same way as the nature does. We are so sensitive when we see a wilting flower, wilting tree because it goes down. All of this goes up. In the same way, to me, this piece is very organic, even if it's made in um, clearly square pieces. That's why I see the counterpoint. It's organic the way it deals with the gravity. It, be, it doesn't belong to man's man made world. It belongs to organic world because it tries to open up. Same with the branch of a tree coming from out of the ground. Then, if you look at the series number four, the gravity ceases to exist completely. It's no, uh, Jeffrey's art doesn't fight the gravity anymore. It doesn't exist. Those pieces, even if they're placed in the field here, they could be floating in space. You know, all this weight of steel is gone. Only the shape remains. And then this piece, which you, you can see on the screen, the gravity comes back. But in a different way, again, it's a very organic shape which is seamlessly and effortlessly comes out of the ground and against. So I think um, for that reason, these pieces belong to the open ground and being surrounded by the organic shapes. I cannot see them in a city uh, surrounded by other shapes which basically hide the gravity rather than just showing organic way how it could be overcome. So, Alistair. I became very interested in thinking about grass and the lawn and the role that that plays uh, 
um, at the sculpture park. It's, it's not natural. It, it has to be maintained constantly, uh, weekly probably. Um, it's, uh, it has its own history. Um, it uh, is an invention of modernity. It dates back probably to the beginning of the 19th century, this idea that you can have a lawn and uh, so, it, so it's ideologically determined. It signifies space. It signifies the absence of trees. It's a clearing. Um, but it's a clearing that is made to look natural. It's a kind of surface on which human activities can take place of whatever nature. So, so the lawn is a kind of figure of background. It's, it's kind of... Um, it, it's a way of bringing uh, the, what we would like nature to be, but doing so in a highly artificial way. Now, the perfect example of that in, the, in North America is Monticello, where Jefferson wanted uh, the green lawns to, to uh, extend from his property right up to the um, Blue Ridge Mountains. So, so there's a nice continuous stretch where you can just allow your eye to drift, drift over this open space. And we all know that there were special pathways built for the slaves which didn't interfere with this, with this uh, sight line, this vision scape that, that was entirely constructed. Now, the, a lot, I, I, I mean, it's very interesting to think about how modern this sculpture, and I'm thinking of welded steel, steel sculpture from the post-war period, not just Jeffrey's work, but also Caro, um, uh, Robert Murray, etc., how they use the ground plane. And um, Caro, actually, I, was, I did have a section of this paper that I wanted to include, um, and I left it out. But Caro um, is very interested in the ground plane. And in a way, he doesn't work very well on the grass. I think he works really well in a parking lot, overlooking, overlooking a, a large expanse of landscape. He's Caro's favourite photographer um, is John Riddy, uh, London-based, a very, very good photographer of sculpture. And Riddy's best photographs, I think, are those in which Caro's sculptures are placed in a parking lot, uh, sort of as you might get at, at a trailhead with the landscape sort of falling away. And, but Caro is very interested in flatness, the flatness of the ground, and he carries that into the work in interesting ways. Um, and so the question is, what do you do with that? What can you say about that as, as a kind of... Why, why does, what larger point is at stake there? And I sort of wondered whether it's a celebration of space in a very kind of abstracted way, in the same way as grass provides. Now, just before Jeffrey responds, if I can just uh, um, allude to Tony Caro, I got uh, him to donate a piece to my college uh, in Cambridge, and Churchill College, expansive fields, and he wanted it in the most small space in the front of the college, tiny area. Of course, the fellows eventually objected, and I had to actually call him up and say, please take this home. Worst day of my life. Um, but Stein's. that's what he chose to do. He chose a very small space, and I, I'm delighted to hear you, because I did not know this at all. Well, this is, this is just me thinking out loud. I, I, it's, not, it's not doctrine. Okay, Jeffrey. I'll throw, a new, I'll throw something at you that you probably never thought of, and that's... Uh, an article that I read before I got back to work here because when I was farming the place I was actually growing clover for seed and watching these beautiful plants and flowers grow all up around me but I read this incredible article as to why Americans love to cut grass and, and, and mow their lawns and it really struck home to me and it's really quite opposite as to anything that you might imagine is that we carry it genetically right from the veld that the low grasses of the veld is what we actually carry within ourselves to revisit within our own evolution 
And I think that's a fascinating idea. And I, I loved it when I read it because that's what I wanted to put out in with these pieces was to get that space to be able to stop time within ourselves and be able to return to that particular thing where we all came from, you know, like that, that time of leaving, leaving the veld. So, so the, the, how's that? Well, <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I'd like to know a little bit more about the Welt. Um, I just, uh, I don't... The short grasslands of Africa. Right. They, they, they uh, where we come from. Among, is it, right? So what's the ideal length of a Welt? Is it, <laughs> is it like uh, Jeffrey wasn't there half an the inch? <laughs> uh, well, you see... I know. It's where it's, you can see the animals. Yeah. Yeah. It has the to be low enough that you can see the animals mm -hmm. because we had very long grass on our property in Ontario last summer and mm -hmm. we cut it and we realized it caused too much anxiety <laughs> to walk in long grass because there would suddenly be an animal in front of you. So you want to cut it down so you can see. Yeah, but most of the animals were herbivores. They actually... If you would look yeah. like sheep, if there's a sheep farm, you'll see it's down to a half an inch. They take it right down to the ground. I think John had his hand up. And then, Marcus, did you have your, your hand up? Okay, John and Marcus. Yeah. Just quickly, uh, um, I mean, you folks are here this week and you see how green everything is. Come back in September and the pieces look completely different because you have a brown field out there. So, I mean, it, it's a, an artist's palette out there. I mean, from month to month, they change and the colors change on the sculpture. So, it's, it's green grass now, it's brown grass in the fall. <laughs> so. Okay, Marcus. It was just a small point. Um, I, I was very struck by that picture, uh, the photograph of the Henry Moore sculptures, that they were actually on plinths, these large rectangular plinths. And I wondered if the grass actually is like a plinth. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah. yeah. No, the, uh, no I, I, my preferred analogy, actually, would be to the uh, white walls of, of a gallery. Um, sculpture parks are, are a phenomenon and one could narrate their history. The ideal sculpture park has green expanses of lawn, and it has walls that are constructed from, from trees or foliage, and you create a... And often landscape gardeners use a vocabulary that is borrowed from architecture in order to speak about the types of spaces that they are using. So I, I think you can sort of... Uh, so... so so I wouldn't see it as necessarily a plinth. I, I think, um, uh, but maybe you disagree. I mean, can you maybe say a little bit more about that? Well, uh, I was just struck by, you know, you're talking about, you know, Moore's sort of desire to be, you know, uniting with nature. And then, of course, you see a sheep kind of standing next to this <laughs> rectangular plinth. And there's a real discontinuity there between desire and reality, it seems to me. Um, but then, you know, you started talking about, you know, the essential artificial nature of the grass and, and the thing is that one needs to use pesticides, presumably, to stop weeds coming up and so on. And there's a whole process required for that. And, it, and, and when you were talking about Monticello, I thought, again, about, you know, British English country houses, you know, and, uh, and, and these wonderful lawns, which would then have a, a dip uh -huh. so that, you know, so that the, uh, yes, uh, of course, um, the, so that the cows could be, you know, sort of down, down below and you don't really get a sense of why they can't suddenly find their way up onto the lawn. And there's so much illusion within that um, right. and, and it's not a it's not a critique of the grass but it just seems to me that yes I, th I think introducing it into an idea of what it does with the sculpture is very important Maria, can you say just one sentence yeah uh, one sentence uh, from the point of photographer there is a very simple reason why the grass works grass absorbs shadows mm -hmm. it reduces the con because of its textured environment, unlike concrete, it reduces the contrast between light and dark. If you put the same sculptures on any flat surface, the contrast, especially from the sun, would be so harsh, so the shadow starts to interfere with the shape of the sculpture. Grass softens the shadows. Absorbs the light. Yeah. Um, I, I, Alistair was just going to make a comment to, to, to Mark. Peter, short comment. Short question to Geoffrey. Uh, when in your career as a sculptor did you begin making your pieces specifically to be exhibited out of doors? 
Mm. That would have been the, the large project that I did in London, Ontario. But I actually had done the first series that I did when I moved back to Canada were made for out of doors. They were, they were out of doors pieces, so now that I think about it, it would be 1969. Yeah. Hmm. 69, 70. Yeah, the, I don't have photographs of those pieces. Those yeah. pieces were a small series, but that was the series. And that there was no going back. No, there was no going yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one, one comment I'd just like to make about the uh, photographs we see here of, of the Moors, that must be at the, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, because if you go to Much Haddon, right. where Moore has, where Moore lived, actually lived, um, the sighting of his work is so poor, I couldn't believe it. Uh, when, I think when Peter and I first visited it a couple of years ago, or maybe it was even last year, that the, the, you can't view the work properly, they seem to be cluttered, um, uh, he's had little hedges put around some... I mean, I was shocked. Mm -hmm. And I, I just kept thinking about Jeffrey's work and how carefully and he cited each add piece. To that, our impression was it, it was like um, a recreation of the indoors, outdoors. It was all compartmentalized mm -hmm. with, with, yeah. with neat uh, hedges. rectangular hedges enclosing the pieces. You got, you got no sense as you would hear, of a space beyond in which the work was actually situated. Yeah, and I wonder what role he played in citing those works in Yorkshire where, where oh. you do get a wonderful uh, right. view. Uh, can, I, can I just interject here? Actually, we're not looking at an installation that Moore uh, set up. This whole field is quite complicated because we want to know uh, when we're looking at these these. Uh, when we're visiting modernist sculptures, we want to know whether the, they reflect the artist's intentions or not. They, um, here it's not the case. Um, th this is part of a major exhibition of Moore's work, which is ongoing, which I haven't seen because I've been based in the US, um, uh, at Yorkshire Sculpture Park about Moore in the land. So these are kind of publicity photographs that were taken very recently of... Um, as particularly the two on the right, um, uh, which appeared in the Guardian newspaper. Now, um, but I did want to say something else, which was the plinth plays an important role, to come back to Marcus, in that, it, that the role of the plinth uh, sets aside a, a, a different t type of space. So it, it's a way of saying... Um, uh, that, that the sculpture occupies different spatial coordinates which are metaphorical or, or scaled. Um, when a sculpture is on the ground, and more could put works on the ground, on, on tiny little kind of bases which were set down, which is similar to what Jeffrey does for most of his works, um, the, the effect is that you are occupying the same space as a sculpture, and as such, you, you have a different spatial relationship with it. I'm very interested in, in kind of thinking about where a sculpture asks you to stand. Um, some sculptures ask you to get really close to them and look at the detailing, and other sculptures ask you to stand a bit further back and take in the surroundings. They need more space, and this is something that's really important for Sergei. I'm sure when you're photographing it, where do you put the camera? I mean, where, what, what, um, what's the distance? And, and different works call for different distances. And that's all part of the conversation that I wanted to raise in this session. Good. Linda. Is that time? Yep, last comment. Okay. Uh, maybe it will lead last into the, the session on photography tomorrow, but I just wanted to say that in terms of the question Alistair was raising about how the uh, sculptor was relating their work to the landscape, it seemed that the photograph had a large role to play in that. So whether Smith's placing, taking his own photographs such that the sculpture appears to kind of be discordant with or dominating over the landscape, or whether it's... Uh, Carola Gideon taking the photographs comparing art sculptures to nature it's not a pure experience of seeing the work in nature it's mediated via the photograph and that yeah. seems important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very important maybe we'll discuss that tomorrow we'll more about that tomorrow and
more about counterpoint. Thank you very much. We should applaud the speaker.